I now may call upon Mr. Rajiv Sarathi to address the gathering. Thank you. Just like uh, Rahul, I'll introduce myself as well. Just, we don't have a uh, moderator, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, I work with a law firm called Perkins Coie. I'm a partner in the IP department. Um, we, let me tell you about the firm a little bit because I think it'll set the context for the rest of my presentation. Um, in this panel, what we did was we, uh, we had somebody who's in-house uh, setting strategy all the time, tell you about how they set strategy. Uh, we had somebody else who's on the service provider side tell you about some aspects of monetization. I will tell you about monetization from an outside counsel perspective since that's a large part of what we do. And then we'll have somebody else in-house who's going to give you some examples of monetization. Uh, the firm I work with, um, you know, just a little bit of uh, background. It, we, we are across the U.S. and in China primarily. Uh, one of the larger firms. We have 800 attorneys. Uh, IP is a big part of what we do, and we represent a lot of technology companies around the U.S. Uh, as I mentioned, IP is the primary aspect of, of a large part of the practice groups at our firm. Um, so a lot of accolades, and we don't need to go through all that. What we do when we do monetization is that we bring together a team of uh, prosecutors, possibly some litigators, some transactional attorneys, um, in order to help our clients achieve the best monetization um, or implement their monetization strategy in the best way possible. And, um, uh, and we're able to do that by bringing together some key skills that, uh, that we think are important for monetization in general. Uh, so that includes patent procurement, of course. Um, since you know, a big part of understanding the value of your portfolio is not just what the business people say the value of the IP is, but it's also an analysis of the underlying assets in that portfolio. You know, when large companies get patents, um, the business team typically just tosses <coughs> over their disclosure to their patent attorneys, and the patent attorney goes off and drafts the application and prosecutes it. And, uh, and if you're not familiar with the patent process, there's a lot of give and take that happens with the various patent offices uh, in the, uh, around the world. And so the claims, as you know, are what define the value of the invention. Uh, or the scope of the invention. And so the business team typically has this concept of what the patent looks like, which typically is not um, uh, current with what, th what really happened during prosecution, what the claims are. And so when, whenever we help a company monetize its portfolio um, or evaluate whether to buy a portfolio, we're not just looking at the overall patents, we're also looking at the claims. We're doing a claim by claim analysis, looking at the file history, looking at the specification, because you have to do that to understand whether a patent has value or not, and possibly how much value the patent has. Um, and then um, we bring in our uh, litigators as well, because oftentimes you know, a patent has already been through litigation, or we're trying to figure out whether we have a good case against a potential infringer, because that's going to help identify the value of the patent as well. Um, so some more, just some information about Perkins Coie that I'll skip. Um, so monetization itself, what do we do? So let me get a show of hands of how many people are in-house in this audience? You're working at a corporation. Okay, so a small number. And how many of you work with uh, outside counsel, so law firms? Uh, a little bit more. And, um, and the, uh, the rest of you, you're not in-house or you're not with uh, outside counsel, so possibly you are service providers, uh, maybe a few other things as well. So the first thing I think Rahul already mentioned is we have to identify um, you know, bunches of assets. So in a portfolio, you're going to have typically um, some, some allocation of assets that relate to either a product or to a feature of a product or something that's going to be interesting to your targets. And, uh, and, and typically what the companies will do is assemble lots of patents, not lots as in many, but uh, lots as in a lot of patents, a, a group of patents. And, uh, and then within each of those groupings, or each of those lots, there are typically going to be some value drivers. So for example, if your lot has 25, 15, 
30, 40, 50 patents, you're going to have one or two or three that are the key value drivers in that lot because you're not going to sell all of your value drivers together. You're going to assemble your lots in a way that you're going to be able to derive value for even some of the less um, valuable parts of the portfolio. So identifying the key value drivers in the portfolio is an important step so that you can formulate your lots properly and then be able to uh, speak in a meaningful way with your potential target. The second thing we do is we will prepare a portfolio or a presentation package um, or maybe it's, you, know, you might, might be familiar with the term data room that litigators will use. We will assemble a data room or a package that we then walk around to the potential targets. So we will go to them and say, here's some um, patents that, that our seller is interested in either licensing or selling to you. And uh, we think that, uh, that this could be valuable to you. Uh, here's, here's some information about these patents. So it might be, for example, claim charts. It could be um, some PowerPoint slides. It could be some additional material beyond just what's in the patents. Because whenever you've assembled a lot of patents, okay, I keep using the word lot, a grouping of patents, your targets are not going to have time to review each and every one of the patents in those groups because you know, they're busy people as well. And, and you want to be able to identify the key value drivers to them and in a way that's meaningful to them, something that they can digest and understand why it might be valuable to them. At the same time, we're also helping our client with the valuation. So basically, you know, if you went to the uh, presentation this morning, um, valuation can mean a number of different things. There are lots of different ways to figure out how much a patent is worth. And if you ask five different people how much a patent is worth, you're probably going to get five different responses. Um, but we, we, we will use a number of different techniques to try to derive what we think is a good um, sort of target range that we want to sell a particular patent for or a grouping of patents for. And then the fourth step we take is to, is to help the client understand um, the seller license analysis. And, and typically, whenever you're doing that, you always want to have the ability to um, support that with litigation. So the threat of litigation is what's eventually going to complete your license. If you're not willing to execute on that threat of litigation, there is no reason for the buyer or the licensee to actually close on the transaction unless it's you know, re really interesting to them for some other reason. If you're just trying to get rid of your patents and derive actual value for them, unless you're willing to litigate it, I think you all understand why the buyer is going to be reluctant to take any next step. Uh, so there are a number of steps for the, the, the seller license analysis, including reviewing the remaining term, uh, cost versus benefit, and so on. And then the fifth step is the final monetization step. So basically, it's uh, you know, t going through with the transaction, completing the title um, uh, transfer, and so forth. So taking uh, at least a couple of those points in turn, um, for the value drivers, we, we, you know, we might use the, the, the help of uh, service providers like Ravel's company, or um, we might do it on our own, or the clients also might have a good understanding of their competitive landscape. So we try to figure out you know, which patents are going to be core to either our client's business or to the target's business, because that might be a place where there are some key value drivers. A second one is, even if it's not presently um, pertinent to what either the client or the target is doing, maybe taking a look at whether it's on the technological evolutionary path. So you know, that's where it's, it's helpful to have um, both somebody from the client side as well as somebody for, who understands that technical landscape on the patent side, on the IP side, to help figure out how that technology is going to evolve because a patent that's not valuable today might be valuable five years from now. On the other hand, a patent that is valuable today might no longer be valuable five or six years from now. And so it's important to make those determinations because that's going to have a, have a pretty significant impact on which patents you're selling, when you're selling them, and how much value you can expect to derive from them. The next thing we take a look at is, even if there are some patents that um, may not be particularly valuable today, if there's an adequate disclosure in there, we take a look at opportunities for improving their value. So for example, one might be if there's a continuation pending. Um, as you, as you know, many of you are probably familiar with patents, a continuation or a divisional it gives you the opportunity to um, expand the scope of your claims or change the scope of your claims, especially in the United States. 
where it's possible to get something different from a specification than uh, possibly what was originally anticipated by the emitters. Uh, a broadening reissue is a case where if you have a patent that's granted, that's issued in the United States, within two years you can fa file what's called a broadening reissue application. Um, and I've filed probably about 50 of these in the last three years where you're trying to derive additional value in these patents by expanding the scope of the claims after the patent is actually granted when you don't have a continuation already pending. Um, the next step is to identify subsets of the value drivers for each potential target or industry. So basically, um, in your grouping of patents, you might have some that are pertinent to a particular competitor, some others that are pertinent to a particular industry group, and, uh, and that helps to uh, you know, uh, identify the speaking points with each of the uh, people you're trying to sell your patents to. Um, I've already talked about you need to understand the industry really well, uh, and you, you have to have at least one high-value patent for each of the groupings or lots. So um, one thing that, that, uh, that we find that some of our clients get hung up on, and I think um, Dr. Sation mentioned this as well, is, is the, the idea of selling your monetization internally. Uh, oftentimes, they're going to be competing interests. The technology group may not want to sell the patents because they think it's important to them or they may have some other vested interest. The board of directors may not want to sell their patents for whatever reason. There are lots of reasons. Um, you know, one, of the, one, of the, one of the things we're seeing now is um, there is an increase in shareholder lawsuits in the United States when, um, and, and this is probably going to increase, when companies are not deriving full value from all their assets. You know, a lot of U.S. companies, as you know, uh, are no longer in the manufacturing space. They don't have a lot of hard goods. And so the investors are looking at the, the intellectual property of these companies and trying to figure out how they can increase shareholder value the most. And if the company and the board of directors is not doing as, as well of a job as it could to derive the most value from its IP, there's a potential for shareholder lawsuits. Um, so another idea in the, uh, in the final monetization steps, uh, of course, you need to identify the prospective buyers and licensees, but then you need to negotiate with them. And um, oftentimes, clients will negotiate with each other, but then when it comes to the, uh, you know, the final days of the transaction, both clients will typically turn it over to outside counsel to get the deal actually done. Uh, and then the, uh, the license and transfer um, activities as well. I should say activities, not decision. One other thing that... Uh, um, that we talked about discussing was the impact of, of open source software. The field that I work in is, uh, is primarily computer software and some hardware. And, uh, and um, you know, we've helped with transactions in a uh, few hundreds of thousands of dollars all the way up to hundreds of millions of dollars. And what I've seen um, is an increased reliance, even by large companies, on open source software. And I think that's happening more and more in emerging countries such as India. Question. Uh, just a comment that was the best talk I've ever heard on open source software from Christina Cavallaro yesterday from Bosch. So she's certainly somebody, you know, if, if anybody wanted to hear more about it, you know, they should approach. She's still at the conference. Great. Thank you for that. And I think there's also another open source session uh, coming up either during the weekend or on Monday. I forget exactly when it is if you're interested. Um, but one of, the, one of the risks in open source software is the, uh, the licenses can oftentimes be viral. When you've um, used open source software and you start to distribute it, uh, you're potentially risking your own uh, IP that you've developed yourself because of the, uh, the license that you've agreed to. Um, and, and, and you have to take a look at when you're doing the transaction, whether you're on the buy side or the sell side, uh, and this is, you know, this is speaking more broadly in terms of not just uh, patents, but in terms of the IP you've developed. You have to take a look at what the activities were. How was the open source used? Was it used without modification? Or was it modified and not redistributed? Or was it distributed? And if it was distributed, was it with or without modification? Because each of the, the answers to each of those things is going to impact how the license is interpreted in your favor or against you. You might have an implied license. You might have given somebody an implied license to practice patents, but worse yet, some some of the licenses have a viral effect on your patent portfolio. Uh, during acquisitions, it's a huge red flag. You know, I I work with one 
um, very large software company that's often buying other smaller software companies. And this is an issue that comes up almost every time uh, with the smaller software companies. We have to take a look at which open source software licenses um, are, are uh, in play. Um, there are various uh, companies that will help you to determine, even in the object code or the executable code, not just the source code, um, whether open source has been incorporated into their software. Um, and it's, it's really important to, to get that done because especially if you're the buyer, you want to make sure that as part of your diligence, you're taking a look at what open source software has been used and what licenses are, are going to affect the, uh, the product you're buying. And then there are mitigation strategies. So you could, for example, hire a different company to uh, redo that software or, or other employees within the same company if they're not polluted yet. Um, so basically you set up a, a, a wall and you throw over some features and you have a group of software developers uh, retool that aspect of the software so that um, you ha you're using proprietary software instead of open source software before you do the redistribution. Um, so if it's, uh, if it's something that's interesting to you, you should definitely attend some of the talks on open source uh, and I'm happy to, uh, to, to uh, speak about that further with you as well. Um, so I think that's it for my part of the presentation. We'll turn it over to Pallavi. And, and we were hoping that this presentation would be, would be a, a discussion or a dialogue um, since we thought that uh, you know, some, of these some of these issues would be interesting to many of you. Thank you.